Good morning, Doug. Today, we want to talk about your hobby. And uh, you have, you've had a lot of hobbies in your life, you know, from polo to skiing and writing and whatever. But, uh, but this is the most interesting hobby that any, I've ever heard of anyone having. And I've partaked in just a, a little way at one time. Um, first, can you just explain what exactly this hobby is? Yes. Yes. It's, it's good as we uh, discuss this that I'm... Um... I have a proper background. I'm, I'm back in the People's Republic of Aspen, Colorado now. And if you're going to do any kind of a proper YouTube thing, uh, the interviewee really should have a background a library. So, as you do. We match so, today, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, like, we're like bookends now. Um, okay, so what happened? I was traveling through the Caribbean once. How long ago was this? When did uh, Reagan invade uh, Grenada? Seems like it was like 82 or 83, wasn't it? About then. Yeah, about then. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so it was before then. Anyway, I was going through a bunch of these Caribbean islands and I landed in Dominica. Uh, that's the correct pronunciation, a lot of people say Dominica, but that's, that's not the way it's said. Okay, so I did what I usually do, used to do anyway, when I'd arrive in a strange capital city. Dominica is a small, very beautiful island, uh, only a, a hundred square miles or so, mountainous, but it's uh, got about a hundred rivers on it. It's no beaches, or three small beaches actually. Uh, so it's not really a tourist destination for that reason. About 80,000 people live there. Anyway, so I get into the small capital city and um, do what I always used to do in a new place. I opened up the yellow pages and looked for lawyers and real estate agents to start with. Why? Because they're usually centers of power in all third world countries or most anywhere, quite frankly. And they'll give anybody an appointment if he's an out-of-towner because he might be bringing business to them. So I called, uh, I called a bunch of prominent people in each category, got appointments. And uh, the idea was to establish rapport with them. And, uh, you know, if they like, if I like them and they like me, then before, you know, I get invited to parties and to people's homes for dinner. And it's a great way to just move into the society. Uh, most people don't do that. They just go to a bar and sit around when they go to a place like that. I don't. Uh, the other thing I do is I go to art galleries because that's where the rich folks hang out, the cultured folks, the upper classes of these countries. And they're, okay, so what happens? Uh, I call this one lawyer, I, I remember exactly, his name was Eileen. And, uh, we got together and we're chatting and making blah, blah. And uh, I talked to him uh, about a couple of concepts, which we'll explore here. And he said, you know, Mr. Casey, what you ought to do is get together with my brother, Kenny, who is the, uh, who's in charge of the Industrial Development Bank here in Dominica. Rather odd thing, an industrial development bank for a country that has zero industry, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Uh, but I, I said, that's fine. So uh, he set up an appointment for me with his brother and uh, we got together for dinner that night. And his brother, uh, whose name was Kenny, was um, suspicious of me. Uh, I might've been an Uhuru jumper. Uh, some white guy shows up and meets with him, probably promoting him on something that's gonna be rather one-sided. So. Anyway, we're talking and, you know, exchanging anecdotes and getting to know each other. And uh, I've been thinking about what can be done to reform these little dog shit countries, which have nothing and are going nowhere. And my plan was basically this. All of these countries have lots of public lands, they call them crown lands in um, ex-British colonies, which Dominica is, single speaking. 
And uh, most of the island is crown lands, publicly owned in other words. So uh, I came up with this idea. I said, Kenny, because we were on first name terms by then, I said, why not take one of these mountaintops, take 50 acres, and we'll put it into a company. Now the company has an asset. And now we need capital for the company. So what we'll say is, why not offer an economic citizenship to foreigners? Because at that time, there were people in, in particular, at that time, about 19, early 80s, Hong Kong and South Africa in particular, that needed a travel document, that needed a second citizenship, a second passport. And we can sell Dominica citizenships to these people for $50,000 a piece. And I said, I think we can sell a thousand of them with no problem. So he's the director of a bank. I figured he could do the math. 50,000 times a thousand is 50 million. And this was about the time, incidentally, uh, for the invasion, uh, before the invasion of Grenada, when the prime minister of Dominica at that time, I remember her name, was uh, Mrs. Eugenia Charles. And when Reagan uh, invaded Dom uh, Grenada back then, uh, he was not the leader of the multilateral invasion force. The, the U.S. always likes to, you know, round up some other country so it looks legitimate. So they rounded a bunch of these nothing nowhere Caribbean islands. So it was a multi a multinational invasion force, ridiculous. But the head of the invasion force was Mrs. Charles, not Ronald Reagan. Okay, mm -hmm. little known fact, but a fact. Okay, so anyway, um, my plan was this. I said. We'll take a mountaintop. Now we got a physical asset. And uh, what we'll do to capitalize it is we'll offer shares. If, if you buy shares in the corporation for $50,000 to the benefit of Dominica, we will offer you an economic citizenship and a passport. And I was sure we could sell a thousand of them, no problem. So Kenny thought about this and he liked it. And then uh, as we played this out a little bit more, an idea popped into my head. I said, why stop there? Why not make it a public company? $50 million, that's good for openers. But now, why don't we put all of the crown lands of Dominica, all of this worthless but pretty real estate into the public company and uh, take the company public in New York, London, and Tokyo. And we might raise a billion dollars at that point. And then I said, it's a public company. And people that are founders of public companies buy the shares more cheaply to start with. And I said, a person who was of significant help, significant aid to the corporation, well, a person like you, for instance, might get a million options at 10 cents. And then later, when we take the company public at $10, and I'm hoping, in his position, he could do the math, a million, 10 cents, <laughs> up to $10, hmm, this is a lot of money. So he thought about it, and we talked some more. And um, 10 minutes later, after a pregnant pause, we were both just sitting there, eh, 30 seconds, no conversation. But clearly the wheels in his mind are spinning over. And he comes back to me, he says, you know, Douglas, I want you to tell me more about those options. <laughs> I, I swear that's the absolute truth and uh, 10 minutes later uh, he goes off and he calls Mrs. Charles president of the country prime minister whatever I forget which and uh, sets up an appointment with me for me with her the next morning to mm. present this plan uh, for how we could transform this, this little island this is very exciting stuff you know here I am just an Uhuru jumper that uh, lands there and next, next morning I'm with the president. That's the good news. The bad news was her father was very sick and he died and I got a call that night and he called Kenny, she called Kenny and he had to, he can't, she has to cancel the appointment. Her father died and it's gonna be a Caribbean funeral and I would have had to have stuck away, stuck around for several more days and like an idiot, because I wasn't taking this idea truly seriously at the time. I got on a plane, 
a day later and left. Really stupid on my part, but I saw what was possible. Mm. And I came back and I worked the idea out with more bells and whistles and twists. How would I really do this? Uh, okay, so once again, idiotically, I didn't get back on a plane and go back to Dominica after and see Mrs. Charles because I had an entree, but a, a couple of years later, because I wasn't taking it seriously in my own mind yet. And uh, the next thing I did was, as South Africa was, um, was uh, dropping the apartheid regime and becoming a, another African country, the whites were out, uh, they took the homelands. There were, I think there were seven homelands, native homelands in South Africa that uh, the white regime tried to make independent and get recognized. And hopefully all the blacks would go to uh, Baputhaswana and Transkei and Siskei. And I forget the names of these other homelands within South Africa, which were supposed to become independent entities. So I have good connections, uh, family connections actually in South Africa. And I got an appointment with uh, Brigadier Upagauzo, hmm. who, ran, who was the military dictator in charge of um, Siskei, the uh, Republic of Siskei within South Africa. Okay, so this was just classic. And it kind of, this kind of really set the stage for, for a dozen more adventures like this, one of which you participated in. And anyway, when I, when I met Gauzo, the Brig, I called him the Brig, because everybody called him the Brig, because he was a Brigadier General. Uh, it was funny. I walked down this long, dark hall in the government building with uh, armed guards at the beginning and the, and, and the end of this long, dark corridor, guards with submachine guns, you know, dictatorships like guys with machine guns, submachine guns, obviously. So we're in, a, and he's like a, a cornered rat sitting in back of his aircraft carrier sized desk. And uh, I explained this plan to him, which I worked out more and I'll talk about the details more. And, and we talk back and forth and he says, Douglas, I need money. What can we do for money? I thought I presented it with him. So, you know, we spent, had several more meetings and he introduced me to his minister of finance. And I found in presenting a, a plan for radical change in these countries, it's not the, the guy on top that's ever the problem. Mm. Uh, he's looking for some way to save his skin to become rich and famous. It's always the guys just under him that are doing the big time stealing, mm. like the Minister of Finance in this case. So he quick washed it. So what was the plan that I presented to Gauzo? And oh, incidentally, what happened to Gauzo after that? Uh, after the minister of, his minister of finance quashed the plan for God knows what reasons, uh, later on when Siskei was reintegrated into South Africa under the black government, uh, he later was indicted and served time, as I recall, we can look him up on the internet, of course, uh, for some type of drug, drug traffic. He really wanted to be a rich guy, okay? And that's the only way he could figure out to do it. So what was the plan I presented to uh, the brig in Siskei. Uh, basically, it was to take 100% of all the government's assets, the parastatal corporations, the government-owned land, the post office. They didn't have an airline, but they could start an airline. Uh, absolutely everything that a government has, and of course, its ability to um, have new citizens and to sell those economic citizenships. And I believe that I, in fact, I'm certain I was the first person to have developed that concept because now, not just Dominica, but about a dozen other countries around the world, most prominent is St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, sell economic citizenships, generally for $100,000 to, in the case of Malta, I think that's the most expensive one, about $2 million. That was my idea because nobody was doing it beforehand and foolishly, I dropped the ball and chased some other rabbit down some crazy rabbit hole. So anyway, there was more to it than that. Just selling economic citizenships 
that's a nice business, but that's just money that all these governments just piss away on things that governments always piss away on money and they're still in debt. But the big deal, the most valuable asset of these tiny little countries is their national sovereignty. Mm. Uh, that's their most valuable asset. The fact that they have a seat in the United Nations and most of these little countries, a major source of income for them is selling their vote as we found in Palau. Yeah. I mean, they get all kinds of countries to pay them lots of money so they vote for whatever goofy project the other country is, needs votes for in the General Assembly. So anyway, uh, I thought it would be wonderful if one of these countries that are down on their luck and never are going to go anywhere would, uh, the plan was this, to put all of these government assets of every type of, every description totally into a new corporation and then take the shares of that new corporation and distribute them 70% of the shares pro rata to every man, woman, and child in the country. So now, it really is a people's republic because the people own the government, which of course, in theory, they're supposed to own the government, but right. in practice, that's just a sham and a fraud. Exactly. But if all the government's assets are in a corporation, yeah, and everybody gets pro rata shares, yeah, they actually are shareholders. So that's 70% of the shares. 10% of the shares would be sold on the public markets to raise money. And what is the national sovereignty worth? Uh, billions, I would say. Mm. So now a lot of money is coming in. It's public even in a tiny little country that doesn't have much of an economy. Right. Nobody even knows it exists, quite mm. frankly. I mean, America would have to invade it to get a lesson in geography to know the, the average person to even know that the company, country exists. So 70% uh, pro rata to the people, 10% take, to take public, 10% to put in trust for the next generation yet unborn in case their parents are foolish and fritter uh, their, the value of their shares away. Well, their kids aren't disenfranchised. So it's kind of trying to defuse a time bomb mm -hmm. with the next generation. And the last final 10% would be to well, people that uh, help make the things happen. Because when you're breaking the rice bowl of all these people that are living off the government, all the parasites, all the people that work in parliament or Congress, and the people that are populating the government offices, you know, all these useless mouths, they will stop it from happening unless you give them an incentive to go ahead with it. So right. that was that final 10%, as, as I talked about with Kenny get their mm -hmm. attention. Okay, so that's basically the deal. And now that it's a, the country is in effect a publicly traded corporation, its objective is to earn money for the shareholders, which means that you can redeploy all these parliamentarians and legislators and whoever uh, to go out to the world's corporations and say, come to our little country, we have no taxes, we have no import duties. We have no export restrictions. You can come here and set up any kind of a business and we welcome you and we'll give you complete stability because we will use the English common law system and we have no laws, we have no, no regulations and our government will do nothing but have a small military in case we're invaded. And of course a small military is worthless if anybody seriously invades them and a police force on the streets and a court system. And that's all we're gonna do. Otherwise, we want you to bring wealth to our country. It would be an exciting proposition, unheard of. And this place, if you did this in a small country, would progress 10 times, 100 times faster than Singapore or Hong Kong did. Because if you visited either of those places back in the 60s or even the 70s, they were shitholes, mm. if you can believe it. Hong Kong and Singapore, well, Singapore was a nothing place. And so it, it was basically a, an oil refinery with the housing development. It was a horrible place mm. back in the old days. Now, it's one of the most advanced cities and economies in the world, without question. Same is true of Hong Kong, of course. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, it used to be a, a cheap place with Susie Wong. Uh, that was it. No more. But the difference, one of the differences is that if they, if they adopted, if or Singapore obviously, which is an incredible model, but if they adopted this approach instead, then the citizens of Singapore would be unbelievably wealthy beneficiaries personally. You know, all the citizens would be of, of this. And it would diffuse political problems because everybody would be a, have a direct participation in the success of the corporation, which happens to be the country. Mm. And, you know, there are problems. I mean, things like, how do you get rid of the legislator and this foolish idea of democracy where you have these legislators sitting around and trying to legislate all day? But what do they legislate on? Economic matters, which will inevitably be able to screw it up. So you'd have to bribe these people to dissolve themselves and instead be ambassadors to foreign corporations, which would be much more profitable for them. But, you know, people are, especially political people, are like jackasses. And it's said when you're dealing with a jackass, first what you have to do is hit it between the eyes with a two by four. Why? Just to get its attention. <laughs> well, there are stumbling blocks with this plan. That's why the countries that I'd like to visit most were run by military dictators. Mm. One guy, make the sale to him, call the shots, and it'll all happen. Mm. So... Anyway, do you think it's too complicated? Do you think the reason, you know, because I know that, you know, I've been part of the, uh, the pitch uh, around this to, to one country and, you know, there was a, an odd technical reason why we couldn't, um, you know, couldn't move further, even though there was a lot of interest from, the, from a lot of people in the country. It was, the whole, uh, Palau, they were all very interested and we visited the, uh, the country, the islands, 17 beautiful islands, most famous for the Battle of Peleliu in World War II, one of the most pointless battles and bloody battles against the Japanese. And so that's what Palau, Palau is famous for, the Battle of Peleliu, the Isle of Peleliu. But yeah, you're right, I'm sorry. We well, no, we, had, we, we had the democratic, the, the, uh, the kind of American model government on board. And then as we got further into this process, we realized there was this whole behind the scenes tribal government that really ran things. Yeah. They were on board with it and they were, like replaying our, our presentation to the, to the tribal leaders on the public television station for a couple of weeks after we left the second time. And, you know, people were on board with it. And we, it didn't, uh, didn't move forward because of uh, the intermediary we were working with kind of became an obstructionist. But what is, why? Well, you know, I did, a, uh, I did a YouTube video with the president. His name was? Uh, uh, Tori Biong. Tori, Tori, Johnson Tori Biong, I yes. believe. And uh, I think it's probably still on YouTube today where I'm sitting down with, uh, with Johnson Tori Biong for 10 minutes and we're talking about this plan. It could have been pulled off except for the reason that you mentioned, that there was an intermediary that was very problematical. But uh, anyway, there are a dozen other stories that... Uh, yeah, and he, the thing is, you know, he was, he, people were eager to do it, people were on board. I just wonder in the other cases, what is, what's the major reason why things don't move forward? Is it that it's, it's just too complicated for people to understand? So they go, well, let's just smuggle drugs instead, or let's just pillage from the UN, you know, food program, or, I mean, what's the problem? Yeah, it's, it, it's very hard for people to change whatever it is that they have. And, um, this is a rather radical plan where the old idea of democracy is actually thrown out entirely mm. and it's run, the government becomes a profit-making corporation owned by the people. Mm. Actually, a very direct but benign democracy. So th it's that. And there are always a class of rich and powerful people in every country every country, even tiny little places, they all have their own version of a deep state. Mm. These are parasites that cling on to the government, maybe aren't into government, but are attached to it like limpets that uh, suck the blood out of the, uh, out of the state. They're uh, cronies, they're cronies. Mm. Yeah. So, and they don't want to see any changes because they're, they're not very imaginative, but they're making a lot of money now and they don't want their rice, their rice bowls, their doggy dishes broken with a new plan. 
they're always the ones that stop these things from happening. The, the fear of losing something you already have is always a greater motivator to humans than you know, trying to build and acquire something new. It is. So, so and, the people and, who have it, just, they do block things, unfortunately. And it's easier, instead of trying to be a politician and make a sale to a whole bunch of people with disparate interests and ideas, it's best to find a place that's run by one guy, a, mm. a people's republic or a military dictatorship. Because the way I, I've approached it in a number of countries is when I sit down with the top guy, uh, my pitch is to say, look, I have a plan and it'll do three things for you and for the country. Number one, in a very short period of time, it'll turn this country into the richest country per capita in the world by far. And you will be the hero that made it happen. So the people will love you, A. You'll become personally rich because you're gonna be a major shareholder in it. Because you can't steal money the way Mugabe and Mobutu and people like that did. That's much tougher now than it used to be. So you gotta do it legitimately. Yeah, he likes that. Uh, and third, you'll become internationally famous, not internationally infamous, where everybody thinks you're, you know, somebody that, and, and you're not going to have to worry about somebody coming up and putting a 45 to the back of your head when the next coup happens. Right. So this is a win-win deal for everybody. And always, the next word out of the guy's mouth is, tell me more. Yeah. And then it gets interesting. Uh, and then I meet the people under them and then the problems start. But it's, it's, always, it's always great fun. And who knows, one of these days, I'll, I'll, meet, I'll meet, I mean, I spent a month in Suriname uh, back in the 80s. Uh, it was very interesting how I, <laughs> how I wound up in Suriname. Do we have time to talk about? Yeah, 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 let's hear it. I don't, this is kind of funny. There was a, an ex-Air America spook that I'd gotten to know over the years. I've always, at least in the past, not so much recently, gotten, gotten to know lots of these, lots of these um, special ops military guys and spooks. And, you know, especially when I was living in Washington, D.C., I just knew lots of these guys. Anyway, one of them was a guy named Patrick O'Connor. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to Patrick. I'm sure he's dead now. But um, so we palled around a lot. And um, so he was working on a scam. And he said, um, you know, he was, try he was trying to uh, set up a Praetorian Guard for the military dictator of Suriname, D Desi Baudrissé, uh, who until recently, incidentally, was the, was the elected president. But back in those days, uh, he'd run a coup and he was called the commander. So I'd already met a brigadier and now I was working with a commander. So Patrick was in touch with Baudrissé's government to train a proper Praetorian Guard because the army was basically dragging their, uh, dragging their FNFALs, the rifles that they used, around by their barrels. Not, not very well done. So that's what he was trying to do. And I said, that's very interesting. So one day I get a call from Patrick who was in London, living in London at the time. And he said, listen, I got a call because in that community, you know, this netherworld of the spooks and, and mercenaries, uh, word travels fast when somebody's trying to pull some stunt in some country. Patrick says, I got a call from a guy in Dallas named uh, Ted Bishop. And he found out what I'm doing. And Patrick imitates Ted's presentation. Yeah, he says, Ted calls me and he says, Mr. O'Connor, I understand, with, with an Eastern Tennessee accent, very deep. He says, I understand we're on the opposite side of a little situation down in South America. And I think we ought to get together and have ourselves a powwow. So Patrick says, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And Patrick calls me up and says, do you want to join the power? And I said, sign yeah. me up. <laughs> Why not? So, <laughs> so the, the next week, uh, 
the three of us meet, Ted and Patrick and myself, in a hotel suite at Dallas Airport. And um, I'm introduced to, to Ted. Uh, but uh, so Patrick and Ted are sitting there talking about the situation in Suriname. And it, these guys could have switched positions. I said, no, you, you play red and I'll play blue. What did it matter? They were, so it was very, it was a lot of fun. So I listen and Ted is undoubtedly wondering exactly what I'm doing there after my introduction. And I said to him, Ted, listen, after you take over this little country, uh, you know, maybe you're gonna sell some mineral rights or an oil concession or something like that, the usual drill and rob the National Bank, the usual drill. But then you're gonna be right back on the road playing a dangerous game, looking for the next country. I got a plan. Here's what you wanna do. And I explained to him about taking all the government assets, which conveniently are the whole country, as well as the Paris Statals, the whole, the whole nine yards. And I explained it to him and he liked it. And I'm quoting this exactly because sometimes people say things and they're just burned into your mind like a, like a diamond and it'll never break, you'll never forget it. And I'll tell you exactly what, what Ted said to me. He said, he said, God damn, Doug, that's a hell of an idea. You know what? The morning after, the night before, when, you know, he says, them C-47s and miniguns, are gonna be just as good the morning after as they are the night before when we turn that army into the biggest jogging team in South America. He said, you know what? That's cookie cutter, this motherfucker, and take the show on the road. And that's exactly what Ted said. And at that point, I realized he was, what he was trying to do was get a contract and money funding from the US, the Dutch, the French and the British governments to overthrow the Baudrillard regime. And this was very close, again, to the time when Grenada was invaded and it was almost gonna be a two for Grenada and Suriname. Mm. But that, and Suriname, the old Dutch, people don't even know the place exists, okay, no. still don't. So anyway, uh, obviously Ted is not gonna be any help to me getting to know uh, Baudrillard and his regime, but Patrick was. So the next week, I, Patrick sets it up and I get on a plane and uh, Air Suriname, they had one 707, probably the oldest flying four engine jet in the world, but that was their national airline. And I flew from New York down to uh, Paramaribo. And uh, I met at the airport by two guys that pulled me out of the line and just whisked me through customs and immigration. So military business, military business. And it was, it was wonderful. It was like, you know, when you're on the right side of a military dictatorship, it's smooth. Mm -hmm. And um, checked into the hotel and spent a month there, a month. Hmm. And I got to know everybody in that damn country. Every labor leader, every religious leader, sports figures, the media people, lots of politicians in the parliament, and socialized lots with Baudrillard himself. I mean, one time he was a, He's an amateur entertainer, but he's a stylish guy. Hmm. So I'm sitting, you know, in one of his shows, I'm sitting there with the Russian ambassador. It was, it was, it was very friendly. It was, it was most amusing. And then when things started getting, I went to parties with the, the Bottersay guys and met all of his staff. And uh, what, probably the crux, was when I was invited to the uh, to his offices, and it was just me, him, the head of his central bank, and one other guy. And I presented the plan to all of them at once, and it was stalled. See, the problem with Suriname is that it has seven, count them, seven different ethnic groups oh. in that country. It's mm. like a snake pit where mm. all these seven different ethnic groups have their own interests and their own desires and their own, the big ones are, they have the uh, Indonesians, which were imported there years ago to work the plantations and they're all Muslims. And then you have the Indians, 
who were imported there a different time. And they're all Hindus. Hmm. And you've got the native Indians. And you've got the blacks who were imported there. And they're mostly Christians. Hmm. So you can see these people have racial, religious, they have, it's, the place is a snake pit. Nobody can, you know, nobody gets, all, there's a small Chinese community. And of course the Chinese own all the commerce because you know, they're just more industrious yeah. than anybody else as they are in most of these places. And who else? Oh, then there's another group called the Bush Negroes, which are, are, were ex-slaves that ran off into the bush and lived like African natives again because they just were off the boat. So this, is a, this place is really quite unusual and uh, it's a powder keg, but only uh, 800,000 citizens of Suriname. It's about the size of Georgia. It's a bit, fairly big country. And, uh, but only 400,000 of them live in the country. The rest of them went to Holland because it was a Dutch colony, mm. the old Dutch Guiana. Anyway, I figured to make this place happen, there was only, I'd never get these groups together. I talked to all of them, okay, except for the Bush Negroes who are out in the bush. And uh, they all liked the idea, you know, they all liked the idea. But uh, how to make it happen? And I figured, okay, at the time there were strict foreign exchange controls in Suriname, and it was very, very cheap living there because if you bought Surinam Surinamese guilders, I think they were guilders they used, on the black market, it was, everything was like free in the country. Hmm. So I figured the only way to make this happen was to um, go top down and bottom up. And I figured that what I would have to do was I'd have to get like 10 guys to come back down there with me so that everybody in the country that I talked to could hear it from somebody besides me, somebody else that could work with them and make rapport with them. Yeah. And people will believe things easier if they hear it from a number of other people that have credibility. So top down, but also bottom up. And I was going to say, take out full page newspaper ads, buy stuff on the national television station, the radio station, and have this presented to people. And uh, although it's a Dutch speaking place, everybody like Holland itself, everybody spoke English. Mm. So that was no problem. There was no language barrier. So I figured, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do both. I'm going to finance thing, the whole thing, bottom up and top down. So I said, now who are the 10 guys that I can get to present this? And obviously they'd have to be intelligent, successful libertarians. And I made the rounds and I, maybe I was calling the wrong people, but I got the most ridiculous, here's something that we are on the edge of doing something of world historic importance overthrowing a government peacefully by turning it into a corporation, unique in world's history, this is a big deal. And owned by the people. Yeah, owned by the people. I mean, this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a big deal. So I call guys up and what do I hear? Oh, gosh, I don't know, this sounds dangerous. Couldn't I get hurt or something? Okay, this guy's an asshole. Call the next guy up. Oh, gee, the university will never let me off for two weeks. I can't, I, I heard every excuse. And then I figured there's nobody that wants to do this. Just as I figured most libertarians, unsuccessful, poor as church mice, chicken shits, basically, talk the talk, can't walk the walk. Mm. So at that point, I figured, okay, this has been a fun adventure. I spent a month in that country and uh, I walked away from it. But I guess I could all, trouble is, is Bowdersay lost the last election, which was only a few months ago. He was indicted for murder because he, he'd been a bad boy back in the old days. And I don't know what's happening. He's not in jail because his party is still pretty strong, but uh, it's a turbulent situation, especially now since Suriname has found a huge oil deposit offshore mm -hmm. and they're going to be fighting like cats and dogs to see who can steal you know, steal the most, uh, the usual. Yeah. Deal. You know, it seems like these, the, the natural setup of these, of, of uh, countries where basically the only way that you can uh, partake in essentially the riches and wealth of a country or if you control the government, 
naturally sets it up so that you have this internal conflict all the time, rather than it just simply be something where it's like, you know, your, your birthright is that you are an equal shareholder. And, you know, you can, you can keep those shares or sell those shares on the, on the open market if you want. But instead of having to fight for almost a civil war type control of the government in order to make sure you get your share of the spoils, um, you know, everyone gets it. Like, it's, it seems like it's more peaceful. It is, and especially if you don't have a government making all kinds of economic rules, which inevitably benefit some little group to the damage of everybody who are paying the taxes and suffering from the regulations and the duties and the can't, must do this, can't do that stuff. That's got to stop. And that, that's why you could take a, you know, a shithole like Suriname. Well, it's actually in it. A nice place. I like Paramaribo. Every building really was a sad place back then. I mean, the only thing I could buy for a souvenir, the only thing I could buy was a stuffed piranha. Uh, really? Not both a black piranha and a stuffed red piranha <laughs> from the rivers. But that was all they had. I mean, there weren't any tourists coming in there at all. It was like one could... flight a week from Amsterdam and one from New York and one from someplace else. I mean, it was, it's changed a little bit, but still. To think it could be, could be Singapore is uh, pretty outlandish, you know, because people, most people don't even know the country exists. If they've heard of it, they don't know where it is on a map. Um, and it, it could have changed everything. I, I wonder, uh, well, first of all, I'd say I wish I would have been uh, of an age at that point to go in and help you with the Suriname one. I think that would have been, I mean, I, I, I always think these adventures of yours are quite fun. And I think that eventually it'll find its way into light. And part of the reason I want to talk about this is because, you know, we won't get the, the more the ideas out there, the more, you know, the more opportunities that there are for it to come to fruition. And I, I know that, you know, then you've been put in touch with the heads of state in lots of countries around the world that you've talked to about this idea. And usually those come from introductions, of course, from people who, you know, know of know about you have heard a little bit about this little hobby you have and might have connections in the government and maybe they know some leader who wants to be uh, in, uh, famous instead of infamous, uh, wealthy without be dealing drugs or stealing from international programs and um, loved by their people. Yeah, exactly. It would be an adventure of world historic import. Mm. And it can be done, especially now that there are countries all over the world which are breaking up. I mean, the Veneto region would like to break off from the rest of Italy. Of course, they want to be socialists by themselves, but at least you can have an intelligent conversation with them. And I don't mind de dealing with ex-communists and uh, socialists and this type of thing, because they believe in theoretically in power to the people. Well, this is direct power to the people. This, okay? is, this, is, this is real, real actual power and ownership by the people. Yep. Exactly. And, you know, we could make this pitch to the Basque region in France, the Basque region in Spain, the Catalan region in Spain, who definitely want to break off from there. You could make this pitch to the Scots who want to break, break off from the UK. I mean, you could make this pitch all ki all kinds of places where countries are about to fall apart uh, and will fall apart. Uh, we'll be making it to Texas, Doug, at some point. It'd be nice to do this for Texas. <laughs> that's, that's right. No, there's all kinds of places where this could be done. And independent little countries, Caribbean islands, all kinds of island places in the world that have small populations that would like to be somebody when they grew up. Yeah, so, so if you if you happen to be watching this and you know somebody who you think that uh, Doug should be speaking with or have connections to the heads of state of, uh, or, you know, one of the uh, key ministers in these different countries, then, uh, you know, make an introduction and uh, uh, I could, trust me, Doug will follow, follow up on it. Um, I think the last place, the last place where I tried this was in Haiti, which is absolutely the bottom of the barrel of all the world's countries. That was a couple of years ago. That went nowhere. Uh, but I spent a week there. And before that, Mauritania, 
very obscure country in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of fun. But that went nowhere too. And where else have I? A whole bunch of places. But, uh, you know, the fact is, is that I've treated it as a hobby. Amusement. Uh, you got to make your own fun. You know what I mean? You do. And, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not skydiving anymore. I really don't scuba dive anymore. In fact, the last place I went scuba diving, I think, was when we were in Palau. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, which was some of the best diving in the world, quite frankly. Yep, it's amazing. Not it's clams amazing and everything. But, uh, okay, I've been treating it as a hobby, but, you know, maybe somebody's going to arise up that'll take this seriously. And I think someone, as the world is, gets more chaotic, I think that opportunities like this, you know, may become you know, uh, more, a more obvious solution for, for you know, as, as governments are in transition, as people are, you know, as maybe economies are being remade. And, you know, the, I mean, just for instance, 10% of the global economy is based upon tourism. Well, that's been shattered utterly. So what's a nation who's relied on that heavily to do? Well, this is a yeah, solution. There's no, there's no more hands, handouts from other governments uh, the way it used to be, because all these governments are bankrupt at this point. That's right. So there's plenty well, of opportunities. They need, they need a plan. I want, I want to ask you just a couple of questions about just because I think people are always curious about how you even get in the room with people. And you, you went through and you explained like your, your habit of, um, you know, that you, you know, uh, would open the yellow pages, you meet with uh, real estate agents, you know, looking for the top real estate agents and the top lawyers in the country. Um, but I think people who are, who've never done this, uh, probably are surprised that that would lead somewhere and you know that they would that 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 could actually lead to you then having dinner later that night with uh um you know with some key minister um how how does that happen i mean what why do you think it is that uh, those opportunities become available um you know we did, i guess i'll just say we did talk a little bit before about how as a you stand out as when you're a foreigner coming into the country now they might look at you in some ways with some suspicion, as I think you said Kenny was his name. He looked at you with some suspicion, but also, um, you know, they look at you as different and unique and, you know, they're, they don't know what box to put you in. So they kind of treat it differently. But what other thoughts do you have or advice can you give people about how, you know, they can make sure they, they end up in the room, they get the opportunity to present interesting ideas and see interesting opportunities? Well, first of all, to be in the room, in order to be in the deal, you've got to bring something to the party. Mm. And what you might bring to the party is foreign capital or some new ideas or some abilities where you can help them make things happen. And I was able to bring all three of those things to the party. So if you're just a guy that's looking to kill time, why do they want to talk to you? I mean, so you've got to have, you know, something specific so that there's a benefit to buyer. And if this guy is the buyer of your ideas, you've got to show him why these ideas might benefit him, make him rich and famous and loved. That's mm -hmm. what people want in life, frankly. Mm -hmm. That kind of covers all the bases. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so you do that and, you know, if he basically likes you as an individual, and sometimes I've met with people that frankly, I didn't like them and they didn't like me and it wasn't going anywhere. Yep. Like, oh, this was about seven or eight years ago. I had a meeting set up with the president of Bulgaria, of all people, true story. So we had pictures taken together, the usual political bullshit. And it was a short meeting because he knew what I was gonna talk to him about and, you know, there was no rapport, there was no nothing. It was nice that I got the meeting, but it didn't go anywhere. So there's lots of false starts like that. But um, that's part of the deal. Know. And you got, ex you, that's, that's one part of the deal too. I think a lot of people might get frustrated whenever they're trying to do something, when they're trying to test the waters and things don't go their way, they presume it, you know, just the idea won't work. I mean, instead it's, it's timing matters and you got to iterate your pitch and you know, you got to improve your skills and all of that and build your network up. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 
and don't don't drop the ball once it's passed to you the way I did on my first very first adventure mm -hmm. in Dominica. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I should have kept running with the ball after Suriname. And I'm trying to think of some other countries that were near misses. Palau was a, a near miss, but you know, they're I'm trying to think of some others. Well, one that I had an opportunity to uh, to do this is there was um, there was a woman who was a subscriber to my newsletter for years. She was a fan. And I met her a decade ago. And I remember she told me, she says, I'm going to go off to the Solomon Islands and get into the hotel business because I like what you're talking about. And I said, that sounds like a great idea, but aren't you jumping off the deep end kind of? Solomon Islands, there's about 700 islands in that chain. The most famous of them is Guadalcanal, but that's all it's famous for. I mean, they still have, I mean, when geologists go to the Solomons looking for deposits, there have been some that have been crucified by the natives. Wow. I mean, this is, yes. I mean, it's, this stuff doesn't hit the mainstream news because most people don't even know the Solomons exist. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a primitive place. So anyway, this woman went there and uh, she met me in Cafajate in Argentina and uh, told me that she was good buddies with the newly elected president, very good buddies. And she promoted me and the, the idea to her. And she said, I want you to come there and meet with him. He'd love to hear the story and all this type of thing. So I said, this sounds like real fun. So at that time, uh, because this was during the cryptocurrency boom, actually. Mm. And I thought, you know what? It might be fun to bring John McAfee along. Mm. I, I met John and he's a barrel of monkeys in trouble now, but a lot of fun, I like him. And uh, I said, I'll take him off there so he can talk about, you know, he can spend a good tale about how we can make the Solomons the cryptocurrency capital of the world in addition to that. And I thought, you know, as long as we're going on Mr. Toad's wild ride, I might as well take P.G. O'Rourke, who run, used to run the National Lampoon, and has yeah. written a lot of books about the third world. And I thought, you know who else would be fun? James Altucher. He's kind of wild and crazy. And uh, this will be one for the record books, the Solomon mm -hmm. Islands, one of the most obscure countries in the world. But that got canceled because John got into trouble. And, um, and uh, also my connection said that as usual, uh, it shouldn't have been announced because the people just under the president saw that there was coming along, somebody was coming along to overturn their doggy dishes. And so they, they quashed it. But uh, there's 200 of these countries in the world. Uh, so plenty can, of opportunity. Plenty uh, of opportunity. But I definitely, that would have been hilarious. It actually just would have been fun, honestly, to have dinner with uh, you, PJ uh, McAfee and James Altucher, uh, let alone take a see you in that environment with that government, just seeing what you could do, so. Exactly, and what I would have done, if we'd done that, and you certainly would have come along too, is I, I would have asked everybody to um, reach out to people in the capital city of the Solomons. I forget the, what the name of the place even is. And, uh, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom and see if there's somebody else that can open the right doors. And it would be, we'd have quite interesting meetings at the end of every day. Yeah. Well, I can vouch for uh, how interesting those meetings can be and how fun those uh, the adventures can be. So hopefully some more of these opportunities will come up over time. And uh, maybe in a future episode, we can, uh, I'm sure this topic basically will come up again in our future conversations. And Listen, with a little bit of luck, like I told you before we, we started the formal interview, we were just chatting. The last call I made before we were talking was to a friend of mine in Moscow who's working to get several of my books published there. And uh, who knows if I can get a, a couple of interesting interviews promoting them on Channel One in Moscow. I might be able to sit down with Vladimir Putin himself, which I'd enjoy very much. That would be interesting. That would be interesting. Incidentally, I had to remind people that they need to go buy your new book. Yeah. They, we're not, we're, we don't usually use these videos to sell stuff, but I think we've got to because this book that we've been, that I was waiting to be published for the last almost two years since the previous, um, uh, the previous one in the series is now out on Amazon. It's called Assassin. Do you want to tell yes, people about it? 
it's actually a really fun book because it talks about the history with a revisionist twist of famous assassinate, political assassinations in the world, the techniques of political assassination, most importantly, the morality of killing other people and political assassination in particular. And it answers the question, well, does it solve a problem or serve a useful purpose to actually do something as radical as that? So it's a hell of a good book. And uh, Charles Knight, uh, it starts out with Charles in prison and his adventures in prison, serving two years from his previous adventures as a drug lord. And his adventures in the next book will be even more interesting, I think. So don't fall behind, get a copy of Assassin. I promise you, you'll be, your time reading it will be well rewarded. It's on Amazon. I'm through chapter five only so far, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm moving and I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I gotta say the, the part that where he's uh, in prison and going through uh, that difficulty was uh, 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 difficult. And he comes out, comes out a stronger and different man. And uh, like the Count of Monte Cristo, one of his, one of his, one of his models. Edmond Dantes, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. Everybody, go buy that book. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Matt.